This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, a dramatic wrap-up to a high-stakes election in Arizona, an election that saw broken voting machines, considerable lead margin swings, beefed-up security, and accusations on Twitter. Projections have Republicans one seat away from flipping the House, and President Biden admits it's likely they will take a majority. Governor Greg Abbott is calling for an investigation into how one Texas county ran its election. Find out more about the problems that warranted an audit from the Secretary of State. Cubans become the second largest nationality illegally crossing the U.S. border. Now U.S. and Cuban officials schedule a meeting to discuss the matter. And armed vehicles patrolling the streets, residents beaten and tasered, citizens searching for food and suicide. As COVID numbers continue to rise in China, strict measures spark anger. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Today's Tuesday, November 15th. Yeah, well, it looks like we're seeing a little bit of a red wave in terms of the House. Well, yeah, the red wave that turned out more to be a red trickle. <laughs> well, Democrats would need to win all the remaining races to hold a majority, which some have said is nearly impossible. Yeah, we're going to find out, but tell us more what's going on in Arizona right now. Right. Democratic candidate Katie Hobbs has defeated Trump-backed Carrie Lake for the Arizona governorship. The high drama contest captivated viewers across the country. With over 98 percent of the vote counted, Hobbs had 50.4 percent to Lake's 49.6 percent. And today's Daniel Monahan has more. Don't let them put doubt in you. That was the message Lake had for supporters on election night, a night that would find her down to Hobbs by as much as 16 percent at one point. But as mail-in ballots dropped off on election day made their way through the tabulators, Lake climbed back into contention, eventually down less than 1 percent. A lot of tension and accusations of slow rolling the count surrounded the election. To ward off any potential threats during the final counting, Maricopa County elections officials announced that security at the vote counting facility had been stepped up yesterday. A reporter told Sheriff Paul Penzone that Steve Bannon had made comments online that people can't let Arizona certify this election. Who is that? Steve Bannon. Is he an Arizona resident? The sheriff warned any potential troublemakers against stepping out of line. But if you do it the wrong way, then there's a lot of deputies out there who have been working hard for the last week. Uh, They prefer not to see you cross the line, but if you do, they'll hold you accountable. The closely fought governor's race between Lake and Democrat Katie Hobbs was one of the most significant in the general election. This because Arizona is a battleground state and is expected to play a pivotal role in the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Lake had vowed to ban the state's mail-in voting, which some claim is more vulnerable to fraud. Her defeat capped a solid week for Democrats, who held off Republicans' hopes for a red wave in the midterm elections. No intention of ever getting into politics in my life. The former television news anchor rose quickly to national prominence and has even been spoken about in terms of the 2024 presidential election. She campaigned on border security, protecting children against so-called woke policies and election reform. She criticized Hobbs for refusing to debate her. Hobbs campaigned on abortion access in the wake of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. This is about our right to privacy. Yes. yes. Our right to economic security. Yes. yes. And our right to control our own bodies. Hey. Yes. The election was affected by various malfunctions. Officials said that on election day, about 26% of tabulators were not working. Other machines were down or printers lacked toner. However, they ensured citizens that all votes would be counted. Lake expressed doubt about the results on Twitter. She also shared a link to an article in the Canadian online news magazine Post Millennial. It claims that Maricopa election officials launched a political action committee in 2021 to stop so-called MAGA candidates. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. 
Next, next, let's take a look uh, at the balance of power in Congress. Republicans are now one seat away from a majority in the House with 13 contests left to be called. Projections show Republicans gaining three seats late last night. Democrats are projected to keep a majority in the Senate with wins in Arizona and Nevada. President Biden on Monday said it's likely the GOP will take control of the House and Democrats lack the votes needed to codify abortion access into law. Here's President Biden's prediction on the matter. I don't think there's enough votes to codify unless something happens unusual in the House. I think we're going to get very close in the House. But I don't, I think it's going to be very close, but I don't think we're going to make it. I don't think they can expect much of anything other than we're going to maintain our positions. President Joe Biden's plan to forgive student loan debt for millions of borrowers was handed another blow yesterday. A federal appeals court agreed to halt the program while an appeal plays out. The ruling is from a three-judge panel from the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis. It comes days after a federal judge in Texas blocked the program. That judge said it usurped Congress's power to make laws. The Texas case was appealed, and the administration is likely to appeal the 8th Circuit ruling as well. The plan would cancel $10,000 in student loan debt for those making less than $125,000 or households making under $250,000 in income. Pell Grant recipients would get an additional $10,000 in debt cancellation. The cancellation applies to federal student loans used to attend undergraduate and graduate school, along with Parent PLUS loans. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is calling for an investigation into how Harris County runs its elections. Abbott cited problems and delays with the voting system. That includes not having enough paper ballots in GOP precincts, missing keys and staffing problems. And today's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. Abbott put out a statement Monday calling on the Secretary of State, the Attorney General's office, and the Texas Rangers to investigate allegations of improprieties in the elections of Harris County this year. Abbott says the allegations range from malfeasance to blatant criminal conduct. The Harris County GOP announced a lawsuit against local election officials on Monday. We're doing this in order to shed light on what has been happening, how Harris County actually runs their elections. Harris County GOP Chair Cindy Siegel claims it's a systemic issue with how county officials run elections. You know, what we've seen over the past year, um, instead of it just being a few incidences of breakdown and how the process has been run, we've seen what's turned out to be a systemic cancer in how Harris County actually runs its elections. Siegel says it's essential individuals are confident in the voting system and that it's not a partisan issue. Those Republican polls where we were running out of paper, I am sure that there are independents and Democrats that were trying to vote there too that didn't get to vote. Harris County Elections Administrator Clifford Tatum says his office is fully committed to transparency regarding the processes and procedures it implemented for this year's midterms. The Texas Secretary of State's office will audit Harris County's midterm results along with three other Texas counties. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Amazon reportedly plans to fire around 10,000 employees. The layoffs will be the largest in the company's history and will target corporate and technology positions. Amazon doubled its staff from the end of 2019 to the end of 2021, going from just under 800,000 to 1.6 million employees. The staff cuts represent less than 1% of Amazon's total workforce and 3% of its corporate staff. Amazon is not the only tech giant conducting mass layoffs. Meta is firing 11,000 staff members, which is 13% of its total workforce. Twitter has also recently laid off around half of its staff following billionaire Elon Musk's takeover of the company. If you're still planning to quite quitting, now might not be a good time because the tables have turned. And ever heard about quiet firing? I spoke to a negotiation expert and manager about both of these trends and how to tackle them. Joining me now is Andres Laris, the managing partner at Shapiro Negotiations Institute. Good morning, Andres. Good morning. So I want to talk to you about quiet quitting and not just as a negotiation expert, but also because you have extensive experience in leading positions. So from a manager's perspective, first of all, what do you think about that trend? It's uh, it's kind of sad. And, and the reason I don't love the trend is the folks that are doing it are really hurting themselves as much as they're hurting the company. Because 
what ends up happening is that's the lasting impression, right? You work somewhere, whether it's a month, a year, 10 years, and then you end up resorting to quiet quitting. And while it does feel like it's a little more balanced because you're putting in less effort, and so it feels like, oh, okay, well, this is more fair, the reality is that lasting impression is how you're going to be remembered. And that could affect the kind of the brand, if you will, within the company, your ability to get references after from there. So it's really kind of a lose-lose situation. Mm, that really makes sense what you're saying. So what would be a good alternative approach, though, for people that are really looking for a better work-life balance? Well, and so the answer is always communication, right? And so I, I laugh because this is very similar to even in the dating space, right? What happens, unfortunately, folks, it's, it, it is difficult to have that conversation with someone and say, I'm not happy. You know, can we change the arrangement? And so while that is difficult, certainly the, the folks that can do that will benefit. So rather than quite quitting, first approaching it that way. And so certainly that doesn't mean if you don't change this or that, that I'm leaving. And that's certainly more of an aggressive stance. And that's probably more of an ultimatum and towards the end. But really that communication step of here's some of the things I'm not happy with. Is there a way that we could change this? And so the two things to really focus on there is one, communicating it, but second, you'll notice kind of using collaborative words like we, what can we do? Because really it, it takes two to tango in this situation, right? It takes both the employer and the employee to work together to get to a solution. Hmm. And talking about communications uh, and the employer, because it seems like the tables really have turned since the labor market is also changing now, right? So now employees may be in turn faced with quiet firing. So if someone feels like that, that might be happening to them, how should they tackle that? Yeah, and, and certainly I feel just as strongly negative to quiet quitting as I do to quiet firing, because really in both cases, it's someone not communicating how they feel about it. And so, and we are seeing certainly the labor market change. And I think it's a little lagging in the indices, if you will, in the aggregate data, but certainly in more anecdotal, we're definitely seeing, you know, and of course we are seeing you know, technologies and other spaces that are laying people off. And so the quiet firing you know, if you're sensing that, the first is almost a, a tactic, if you will. So when we think of negotiation tactics or communication tactics, one of the the best ways to combat that, if you will, is to call it out, right? So, you know, I'm getting the sense that X, Y, and Z is happening. Is that on purpose or tell me more about this? And so, again, the key there being it isn't a confrontational approach. It's asking, this is what I'm seeing and feeling. Is that intentional or am I missing something? And the key is to do it. The first step is to do it in a very you know, uh, harmonious way, in a very comfortable way, because you don't really want to amp up the pressure immediately. Now, if that doesn't work, you can slowly kind of build up the pressure, if you will. But it, the first step is really asking questions more than anything. Mm, very interesting. Enter the conversation in a harmonious way. And what do you think, it really is a question that is floating around now, what do you think has happened to communication at the workplace? And, you know, how can, can people contribute to fixing that? And so we're missing that in the workplace in many cases where people are working fully remote or more, you know, partially remote or very, you know, a, a more than half of their time remotely, that can lead to not necessarily eroding relationships, but that can lead to less trust being built and communication not being as rich. And I think that's a big part of this. It's easier just like it is to, you know, fire someone or deliver bad news in an email as it is on the call. And then, you know, certainly much easier than it is in person. Well, the same applies. And so what's happening is if you're having less of those in-person communications, you're giving yourself less of that opportunity to build that relationship and have that richer communication. And so unfortunately, that disconnect leads to things like this. Hmm, fascinating. Really great insights. Thank you so much, Andres Laras. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This week marks the 8th anniversary of National Apprenticeship Week. First Lady Jill Biden kicked off the annual celebration with students and educators on Monday. And Denise Angela Moy has a story. Rolling Meadows High School students in the Chicago area celebrated National Apprenticeship Week with First Lady Jill Biden. She held a roundtable on Monday with several members of President Biden's cabinet, along with students and educators to discuss the benefits of apprenticeship programs. The First Lady says the apprenticeship program is a pathway to job opportunities. Not everybody needs to have a four-year degree. This is just, it's all about jobs. Rolling Meadows High School has an apprenticeship program called Career Pathways. 74% of the school's 1,900 students enrolled in 39 career fields offered in the program to explore their career interests. Sophomore Kate Foley says she learns practical skills from the program. Like the first week of class, we did 
uh, an egg drop challenge mm. where we had to design a protective case for an egg and then drop it from the top of the bleachers and see if it would survive. Ethan Salibio, a senior, is enrolled in the computer integrated manufacturing field. The program's pretty solid. It's uh, identified my strong points. I now know, yeah, I work a lot with my hands. Michelle A. Smith, vice president of Harper College, says its associate degree programs help students advance their practical skills for four-year colleges and careers. And we're all focused on making sure the students in this region can graduate college and career ready and that they have the opportunity to get gainful uh, jobs that will pay them a family sustaining wage mm -hmm. and an opportunity to really contribute to economic development mm -hmm. right here in their home community. U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo says a few hundred thousand manufacturing jobs will be coming to the Midwest with the implementation of the CHIPS Act. She's pleased that the apprenticeship program builds a talent pipeline. I'm glad you're getting ready because we've got a lot of jobs coming your All way. Right. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News, Illinois. Coming up, U.S. and Cuban officials meet to discuss migration as President Joe Biden records his third largest month of illegal border crossings. And as COVID infections continue to rise in China, the country has continued to enforce its strict zero COVID restrictions, including armed vehicles patrolling the street and hungry residents being assaulted by local officials. All that coming up on NTD Good Morning. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. I see the future is really bright for me. The high school diploma is just added to the confidence and now I feel unstoppable. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back. U.S. and Cuban officials will meet in Havana to discuss Cuban migration to the United States. Cubans are now the second largest nationality after Mexicans illegally crossing the U.S. border. Cuban crossings the border were stopped nearly 29,000 times last month, up by 10 percent from September. Authorities stopped Cubans over 220,000 times in the fiscal year ending on September 30th. This was a 470 percent increase from the year before. Talks between U.S. and Cuban officials reflect an ongoing 30-year engagement between the neighbors on migration matters. Overall, U.S. Customs and Border Protection said illegal immigrants were stopped around 230,000 times in October, which is up 1.4 percent from September. And New York City will spend at least $600 million to provide shelter, education, health care, and legal aid to thousands of illegal immigrants who've arrived in recent months. That's according to its Independent Budget Office, or IBO. The estimate was calculated based on more than 17,000 illegal immigrants currently living in city-run shelters or in hotels. But this figure is likely to increase by a further $250 million if an additional 10,000 immigrants arrive. IBO Acting Director George Sweeting wrote in a statement that the total cost of providing the identified city services cannot be estimated with certainty as the number of people arriving continues to evolve. Governor Kathy Hochul said on Friday that state funding is being discussed to handle the migrant surge. The comments followed the revelation that Mayor Eric Adams will be closing the city's migrant tent city on Randall's Island. Inhabitants will be relocated to the Watson Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. Adams has declared a state of emergency over the immigrant influx. Despite the rest of the world mostly moving on from coronavirus lockdowns, China has continued to enforce strict zero COVID restrictions in many areas of the country. And the severity of the lockdowns is resulting in conflict. Here's the story. As COVID infections continue to rise in China, Chinese Communist Party officials are threatened with punishment if they don't have their area under control. 
The tight restrictions have sparked clashes between residents and local officials. In a video from November 7th posted by a resident from Linyi in China's Shandong province, local COVID enforcers are seen dragging locals over the pavement before hitting them. Some officers in black suits are seen kicking a person in the head. Another woman was thrown to the ground. And in Hunan province, video shows an armed police vehicle with the logo of Zhuzhou Special Police patrolling the streets. The loudspeaker says armed patrols are now being carried out in key areas of Yutong Street. It says citizens are required to strictly abide by prevention regulations to not go out or gather together, and that those who do not obey orders will be dealt with severely. The long lockdowns are driving local citizens crazy. Many lack food and supplies. Several videos circulating online show residents trying to break out from the lockdown barrier. But some can only cry for help. A video of an elderly man kneeling for help in Guangzhou went viral. Locals said the elderly man was begging the staff to save his grandson who has a fever, but no one is there to help. Some people recorded a video of the scene and uploaded it online, but were threatened by police to delete it. Local residents say similar clashes continue. And in Xuchang city of Hunan province, a video shows a local citizen complaining to a local government official that he hasn't been able to eat for two days. The city has been under lockdown for 28 days. The man in the video says, what will you do if I starve to death? And the official replied, if you starve to death, I will sign your death certificate. At the end of the video, the hungry man was beaten. We're staying in Asia. Amid North Korean nuclear missile threats, the U.S.-South Korea Combined Forces Command has relocated its headquarters to America's largest overseas military base. U.S. and South Korea officials celebrated the move at a ceremony on Tuesday. And Denise Flinders Kingsley has the story. The U.S.-South Korea Combined Forces Command, or CFC, has moved its headquarters from Seoul to Pyeongtaek. 43 miles from the South Korean capital. The new location at Camp Humphreys military base is the headquarters of the UN Command and the US Forces Korea. Camp Humphreys is the largest overseas US military base. The move will strengthen the combined defense posture in the region. We decided to strengthen U.S. ability for extended deterrence to restrain and respond effectively to North Korea's nuclear missile threats. In particular, we made it clear that North Korea's attempt of a nuclear attack will lead to the end of Kim Jong-un's regime. The U.S. Defense Manpower Data Center says there are around 28,500 U.S. troops stationed in South Korea. That's the third largest garrison of U.S. troops behind those in Japan and Germany. The most precious resource of the Republic of Korea, the United States, and the sending states that have stood with us for the last 44 years has not changed, and it will not change. And while we work to assure the Korean people and to prepare for combat, we pray for peace. Our love of peace, freedom and security has not changed. It has only gotten stronger. The CFC headquarters was based in the South Korean capital for 44 years before the move. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. Coming up, and chocolate lovers visit Fontainebleau Castle near Paris for a gourmet chocolate fair. We have highlights from the event featuring delicacies from chocolatiers and pastry chefs. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. The lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational the 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness. Invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art 
The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Good to have you back with us. Chocolate lovers headed to the famous Fontainebleau Castle near Paris over the weekend. A chocolate fair brought together pastry chefs, gourmets, and even chocolate sculptures. NTD's France correspondent David Vives was there. According to some chefs, chocolate is perfect to warm people's hearts. Before becoming a common ingredient in candies, pastries, and desserts of all kinds, chocolate was reserved for the top elite, notably the French court. Historical documents show the consumption of cocoa in Europe began in 1544. That was precisely the golden age at the Fontainebleau Castle near Paris, says the castle's pastry chef Frédéric Cassel. I would like to remind you that it was Christopher Columbus who brought the first cocoa beans to Europe. The chocolate was brought to royal court. The chocolate was crushed and then mixed with milk to make hot chocolate, like Marie Antoinette used to consume, for example. Imperial Chocolate was the title for the fifth edition of a chocolate fair that attracted chocolate makers, pastry chefs and gourmets. The fair included chocolate making demonstrations, tasting and the sale of chocolates made by the best in France, as well as a cake contest. The contest winner says, making chocolate cake is about bringing together a variety of flavors to highlight the chocolate. It's a chestnut mousse with glazed chestnuts and blueberries hazelnut praline crunch, meringue, and chocolate bisque. My family and friends usually ask me to make chocolate cakes, and when I am invited, I am always asked to bring the dessert. Chocolate pastry is a formal course in French culinary schools. Chef Stéphane Mona manages an 18-teacher team at a local high school. He showed some of his students' creations. Here we have pieces that were made by children by our students over several days and they made and assembled the piece on Thursday, so it took them two days. You have several kinds of chocolate, chocolate created with a mold, by hand, and sculpted. In the castle's corridor, marble statues had to share the space with their chocolate counterparts. Just as the marble statues, the chocolate ones will never be eaten. They will eventually melt or break over time. At this level, for me, it's really an artistic piece. It's a huge job where all the scales have to be put one by one on the dragon. So it's really a beautiful work. And here, it's like a work of art, actually. Except that this one, it's eatable. But you don't really want to eat it. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. I was always wondering what happened to all these chocolate statues and tools that you see in Christmas markets in Europe, you know? That's interesting. You know, if it was a white chocolate statue, I would totally eat it. You would? That almost feels illegal, though, no? Yeah, well, if I was hungry enough. Well, good point. All right, that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you. Before you go, you can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. Shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.